Suppose we had this differential equation, d phi by dt equals negative phi, and we knew that at time zero, phi is one. How can we work out what phi is at all other times? As this is an intentionally simple example, anyone who is familiar with solving these kinds of ordinary differential equations will tell us that the function is e to the minus t. We can verify this by just plugging this into the differential equation and the initial condition, and seeing that it satisfies both. This is called the analytical solution. But what if we were solving something more complicated? For example, suppose we were solving some fluid dynamics equations, which in general will take this form. Of course, this equation is very general, so depending on what we replace phi with, and what we set as the right-hand side, the equation represents conservation of a different quantity. For example, mass conservation looks like this, and momentum conservation looks like this. The point being that we need a general method of solving equations that include a time derivative that works regardless of what the rest of the equation looks like. If you're not familiar with these equations, don't worry. The point of the example is that these equations can't be solved analytically, except for a handful of simple cases. So we tap into our inner engineer and approximate everything. Instead of finding phi at every possible time, which there are infinitely many of, we just find phi at finitely many times, t0, t1, t2, and so on. Let's call the corresponding values of phi, phi0, phi1, phi2, and so on. This is called the finite difference method, from which the finite volume method is derived. The name might be intimidating, but it's actually a fairly simple concept. Let's go back to the simpler differential equation. Suppose we know what phi is at tn, and want to find phi at tn plus 1. Our first step is just to integrate both sides of the equation, between tn and its neighbour tn plus 1. We can integrate the left-hand side quite easily, but now we get stuck. We need to know what phi is as a function of time in order to integrate it. It seems like we've gone nowhere, but in this form we can start approximating this integral, and there are many different methods we could use. In the explicit Euler method, we assume that, for the purposes of the integral on the right-hand side, phi is phi n between tn and tn plus 1. Effectively, we're extrapolating phi forward in time, from tn up to tn plus 1. So this is often called the forward Euler method. Since we're now integrating a constant, we can take that out of the integral, call the difference between tn and tn plus 1 delta t, and from here we rearrange to get phi n plus 1 in terms of phi n. What this allows us to do is start at time 0, choose the time step size delta t, plug in phi naught, and get phi 1. Now that we have phi 1, we can get phi 2, and so on. Let's plot this on a graph and see how this method compares with the analytical solution, which is e to the minus t. As a reminder, we've started with the differential equation, integrated it approximately, and then found a function to link phi n plus 1 to phi n. We split the time axis into finitely many times, each spaced delta t apart, and run the algorithm. Suppose our time step size is 0 0.8. Then, using the explicit Euler method, and starting at phi naught equals 1, the graph we get looks like this. The accuracy is a bit disappointing, since it tends to overestimate the slope, but it looks vaguely similar to the analytical solution. To improve the accuracy, we could reduce delta t, maybe to 0 0.1. Now the graph is really accurate, but there's a problem. To work out the value of phi at, say, time equals 2, we need many more time steps than before. This means many more calculations need to be done, so it takes longer to calculate. So there's this trade-off between accuracy and speed. What if we just focused on speed at the expense of accuracy? Well, this means increasing delta t. Delta t of 1 looks okay, phi immediately just goes to 0, and stays at 0 which, if we squint, still looks like the correct solution. After all, e to the minus t also approaches zero, but after a longer time. Let's increase delta t further, to 1.2. Now we start to see some issues. phi goes negative, then bounces back to positive, then negative again, and eventually settles at zero. This is called instability. Let's go even further, to 1.9. Now the instability is really big. phi does slowly approach zero over time, but the graph looks nothing like the analytical solution. Let's go to a delta t of 2. Now, phi doesn't actually approach 0, it just bounces back and forth between 1 and minus 1. Why is that? Well, look at the approximate equation we came up with. If we plug in delta t equals 2, then we end up with phi n plus 1 equals minus phi n. 
so each successive phi will just be minus 1 times the previous phi. Pause for a moment to predict what will happen if we go to a delta t of more than 2, say 2.1. Let's try it. Now phi actually diverges over time. Phi will blow up to plus or minus infinity given enough time. This is the complete opposite of what we expect. Just as a reminder, all the computer is doing is applying the approximate equation we came up with at t0 to get phi at t1, then doing the same at t1 to get phi at t2, and so on. So we see that explicit Euler, also known as forward Euler, is only stable for small delta t. We call this conditional stability. Can we do better? Let's try a slightly different approach. With explicit Euler, we approximated phi to be phi n between tn and tn plus 1. Effectively, this is extrapolating phi forward in time from tn. But what if we did the opposite approximation, namely approximate phi to be phi n plus 1 between tn and tn plus 1? Effectively, this extrapolates phi backward in time from tn plus 1. You might be thinking, hold on, we don't know what phi n plus 1 is. We know phi n, but not phi n plus 1. The whole point is we're trying to find phi n plus 1. And you'd be right, that isn't actually an issue. Let's perform the same integration steps as with explicit Euler, again calling the difference between tn plus 1 and tn delta t. Let's rearrange the equation so that all the phi n plus 1s are together, and everything else is on the right hand side. Now we can factorize the left hand side, and from there, divide both sides by 1 plus delta t. Look at what we have now. We have a new equation for phi n plus 1, purely in terms of phi n. So, given we know phi n, we can work out phi n plus 1, same as before. Remember, this other equation is the one that explicit Euler came up with. Let's see what graph we end up with. Again, we're solving d phi by dt equals minus phi, and the analytical solution is e to the minus t. We split the time axis into finitely many times, each space delta t apart, and run the algorithm. Again, let's start with delta t equals 0.8. The accuracy isn't the best, as it tends to underestimate the slope, but it looks vaguely right. Again, we can improve the accuracy by making delta t smaller, but there's still this trade-off between accuracy and computation speed. Let's try increasing delta t to 1. Still looks okay, it's less accurate, but still roughly right. Let's make delta t 1.2. Still fairly similar, less accurate, but roughly right. Remember, with explicit Euler, at this delta t, the graph started oscillating, and at delta t equals 2, the graph looked completely wrong. So let's see what happens at delta t equals 1.9. Nothing. It's still a bit less accurate, but still stable. How about delta t equals 2? Still nothing. 2.1? Still stable. Remember, all the computer is doing is applying the approximate equation we came up with at t0 to get phi at t1 then doing the same at t1 to get phi at t2, and so on. So we see that implicit Euler is always stable, no matter what delta t we choose. This is called unconditional stability. Still, the accuracy wasn't the greatest, with explicit Euler going too low, and implicit Euler going too high. Maybe a mix of both would be more accurate. Remember, this is the approximation we used for implicit Euler. But let's try mixing implicit Euler with explicit Euler with a blending coefficient theta. This method is called the Craig-Nicholson method. We do the same integration steps as before, move all the phi n plus 1 terms to one side, factorize, and get an equation. Notice that when we plug in theta equals 0, we get exactly the same equation as with explicit Euler. And the opposite is also true. At theta equals 1, we get the same equation as with implicit Euler. At theta equals a half, the method is called pure crank nicholson So let's run it, using a theta of 0.5, meaning we're mixing equally between explicit and implicit. Again, we have a delta t of 0.8, and the initial conditions are phi equals 1 at t equals 0. This is much better. Even at delta t equals 0.8, the graph is very close to the analytical one. Again, we can make delta t smaller to get a more accurate graph. Let's try increasing delta t to 1, as we did before. Still very accurate, but not unstable. Further? Still good. Up to delta t equals 1.9? After delta t equals 2, we see the graph actually dips into the negative. It's become a bit unstable, 
Let's try changing theta. First, let's increase it to 0.95. Now the graph is very similar to the implicit Euler. And the opposite is true when we go to 0.05. Now the graph is quite unstable. So crank nicholson is kind of the best of both worlds, and we can choose how much stability we want with theta. But so far, we've only been applying methods to just one very simple differential equation. What about other differential equations? Before, we were working with this differential equation. Let's now try to work with an arbitrary differential equation with d phi by dt equals g of phi. g is just some arbitrary function of phi, which gives the rate of change of phi over time. I'll call this the slope function. Let's also generalize the initial conditions to just phi naught. The crank nicholson method for our old differential equation gave this approximate integral. Let's now apply the crank nicholson method for the arbitrary differential equation. This results in a new approximate integral. Let's now use this integral. We start with the differential equation, integrate both sides between tn and tn plus 1, as before, apply the approximation, work out the integral, and move all the phi n plus 1 terms to the left-hand side. As before, theta allows us to blend between explicit and implicit. But now we get stuck. We can't factorize the left-hand side because we don't know what g is. So we can't get an equation of phi n plus 1 purely in terms of phi n. This raises some new challenges. This now looks quite complicated. There's a lot of symbols and now a new function g, so I want to show you a more visual interpretation of the equation. Let's consider two times, tn and tn plus 1, spaced delta t apart. Let's start at tn with a value of phi n that we know. Using the slope function g, we can find what the slope at tn is. If theta is 0, then that's the same as extrapolating the slope forward until we reach tn plus 1 to get phi n plus 1. This is the same as the explicit Euler method. Try plugging in theta equals 0 and g of phi equals minus phi into this equation and check this is consistent with what we had before. Now let's try theta equals 1. We start with a guess for phi n plus 1, work out the slope, and extrapolate backwards from tn plus 1 until we reach tn. But our backwards extrapolation doesn't match up with the value we know at phi n. The extrapolation is too low. So let's try a bigger guess for phi n plus 1. Now we've gone a bit too far, and we adjust the guess again. The correct value of phi n plus 1 is the one which, when we extrapolate backwards by delta t, we get phi n back. This is the same as implicit Euler. Note that this is actually quite a lot more complicated to calculate than explicit Euler, but the unconditional stability is worth it. Now let's try theta equals 0.5. This is the same as extrapolating backwards only by theta delta t from phi n plus 1, and extrapolating forwards the rest of the way. Remember, phi n is fixed, so the forward extrapolation is also fixed. But we need the forward and backward extrapolations to be equal, as per the equation. So we need to adjust phi n plus 1 until this is true. As we decrease theta, we rely more on the forward extrapolation and less on the backward extrapolation. The opposite is also true. Typically, a theta of just over 0.5 is used. This way, we get the superior accuracy of pure crank nicholson with the added stability of implicit Euler. There's a lot going on in this graph, so feel free to rewind and look at the animation again. Let's try a different approach. Instead of just considering two points at tn and tn plus 1, as before, consider an additional point at tn minus 1, each with corresponding values of phi. Draw lines between these points. What is the slope of each line? This is simple to work out, but look, we have a slope changing over time. It goes from the left slope to the right slope over a distance delta t. We can write that mathematically, simplify it a bit, and we end up with this expression. This is the rate of change of slope between tn minus 1 and tn plus 1. How can we use this to help with our approximations? With implicit Euler, we approximated the slope to be constant between tn and tn plus 1. Let's now take into account the rate of change of the slope. Plug in dg by dt, and integrate the first term, since it's just a constant. 
Now we'll use a change of variables for the rest of the integral, and then integrate it and simplify it. This is called the second order implicit Euler method. And implicit Euler is more accurately called first order implicit Euler. We can now plug this into the integrated version of the differential equation. Simplify, rearrange, simplify a bit more, and we end up with a new equation. This time I've rearranged this equation into a slightly different form to before. Let's try it with a new differential equation. In this case, the exact solution is 6 over t plus 2, where the slope function is minus 1 sixth phi squared. The initial condition is phi naught equals 3. As before, let's split up the time axis into finite steps. Since we don't have a value of phi before t equals 0, we can't apply the new method initially, since the method relies on having three data points. So for t equals 0, we need to apply a different method. Usually first order implicit Euler is used. Near the start, the graph is a bit inaccurate. This is the influence of the first order implicit Euler. After the first few time steps, the graph is much better. Of course, we can decrease delta t to improve accuracy. As we increase delta t, we don't see instability in this case. But in reality, this isn't always true. Second order implicit Euler can be unstable. It's not unconditionally stable, like first order implicit Euler. To summarize, if we rearrange all the methods so that phi's are on the left and g's are on the right, we get the following equations. Explicit Euler extrapolates forward from Tn, while implicit Euler extrapolates backward from Tn plus 1. These two methods are often called forward Euler and backward Euler respectively, for this reason. These two methods are first order accurate, meaning the error per step, called local error, is on the order of delta t squared. Of course, the error adds up over each time step, so the global error, the error at a given time, is on the order of delta t. Frank Nicholson is a combination of implicit and explicit Euler, and uses a blending coefficient theta. Second order implicit Euler is similar to first order implicit Euler, but uses a third point to take into account the change in slope. If Crank Nicholson uses theta equals 0.5, then both methods are second order accurate, meaning the local error is on the order of delta t cubed, and the global error is on the order of delta t squared. I've not proved the accuracies rigorously here, but the description contains some links to derivations. That brings us to the end of the video. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you found these explanations intuitive. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments, and check the description for links for more information.